which I'm like, I think Burning Man is just people who love trick or treating because it's starting to sound a lot like just, you know, you dress up in a weird costume to scare away spooky spirits and you do your little trick to barter for some food. I'm like, isn't that what Burning Man is? Or drugs. A barter. Yeah. yeah. Or you get some drugs. <laughs> yeah, but we got spirits. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. We got spirits for the spirits, spirits, for spirits. on the- Halloween. Spirits for spirits. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, and that in turn, the response is to make an organized trick or treating effort. So then you get. Oh, to get you, the youths in line. They're like, yes. you, like, listen, youths, like everyone, we're giving you a night. You have your night to be rambunctious. We'll call it rambunctious night, but that didn't kick, that didn't take off. Mm, right? they, no, like like rambunctious night. Night. <laughs> they were like, hmm, let me workshop it. <laughs> and then immediately you get World War II. And you get sugar rash. Oh, shit. And then there's no more trick-or-treating. Oh, I thought treating. you meant the, the trick-or-treating cause no, World War II. No, no. <laughs> Not because, like, every time I have gone to Mexico, I have gotten kidnapped. And, you know, we did get in that unmarked van. Yeah, and so. we weren't kidnapped. It was fine. Yeah, there was, like, a house that they were, like, open door, come in, get a cupcake off the cupcake stand, sit down, play a song on the piano. There was one house you walk by, the garage door opens, they play, like, a whole live band plays a song. Welcome, ghouls and goblins all to We're Experts Now in a very special episode. I am your devilishly charming host, Rebecca. Oh, and I'm charming in a completely different way today. And I'm Jackie, and we're here for spooky season. I know we've been talking about it all month, and... Listeners, if you can't tell, we're excited. We showed up in costumes. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, you. This is why you gotta go to the YouTube. You gotta subscribe. Got it. You got. Yeah. And if you haven't, then please, please tell us what you thought of our costumes. Back some. Why don't you tell us what you are and what you're? Inspir- oh, I lost my crown already. Oh, well, losing her crown already. Um, I am the devil's advocate. I don't know. I think I'm just the devil. I have, mm-hmm. you know, not very many. This is the easiest costume I could pull together, you know, just a little devil horns and some some cute red just on a theme. Yeah, you're rocking and, it. Yeah, I'm just feeling all that badass. Mm-hmm. I, on the other hand, ripped off Lance's costume from a few years ago when he was Miss Universe. And so <laughs> I got a galaxy dress on and I have my crown, which is going to fall off probably multiple times during this recording. But I will replace it at one point with probably another crown that's easier to keep on my head (laughs) i do love a pun costume like i think it would be really cute to do a punny couples costume where one of you is dressed like like a smucker's jelly like little beret gingham plaid beret hat and like a like a red top and you know like you're a jar of jelly super cute and then the other person is dressed with like a uh, opalescent bell bottom bodysuit and they're a fish because those costumes separately exist and then together jellyfish like i okay. love like a pun like that okay. but i mm-hmm, also mm-hmm. i really think that halloween is about the heart of it is like devils ghouls so I do think a classic devil is always a good way to go. It's something scary. Like sometimes you could be a scary concept like, oh, climate change or toxic masculinity. But I'm like, I really I think it's you should go with the spirit and be spooky. I mean, I, on the other hand, has have been a princess 45 times <laughs> high up there. I've also been a spice girl three times in my life now. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I, you know, I've always been a little bit of a girly girl. I am kind of living that girly girl lifestyle. So surprise, surprise, I showed up as a beauty pageant queen. <laughs> Which to some people is scary. We're going to have to, folks, listeners, if you aren't seeing me Wardrobe right now, I'm putting on the uh, birthday crown that Uh-oh. I had purchased for me. And that's what I'm going to wear the rest of this episode because it just works. I'll retire this crown. You know, look at this over here. The jealousy. Uh, you need to shame that Etsy seller. Uh, it was Amazon. So oh, okay. I'm pretty sure they were shamed just by Bezos. getting on there. <laughs> Bezos. Uh, what are we talking about today, Bex? 
Today we're getting in the spirit of things, in the harvest season, in the celebration of all things spooky, and we're doing a little deep dive on trick-or-treating. I love this. I love I, this. You want to you wanna tell the listeners why trick-or-treating is so special to you? Trick-or-treating is very meaningful to me because I didn't get to go trick-or-treating for the first time until I was an adult. What was it, last year? We went to last year. Yep. your neighborhood. <laughs> and it was like so long. It was like I had so missed the boat on trick-or-treating that I was like, okay, now I'm an adult. Now it's creepy if I go by myself. So I need a child to go with. So I was able to commandeer your lovely niece. And she was so um, welcoming. And she was like, here's how we do it. We're going to go up to the door. We're going to ask for the candy. Don't take too much. Like It was like I was learning all the rules from a child. It was exactly the right way to do it. It was a gorgeous time. Um but, and that neighborhood serves alcohol. So the really oh glorious gosh. part of that place is that like, the perfect go up, like, do you want a shot of tequila? Do you want a mimosa? Like, here's a jello shot. And you're just like, you know what? I did want this. It was, it was like out of a, I was going to say out of a Disney movie, but it's like even m- more so because like, yeah, there was like a house that they were like, open door, come in, get a cupcake off the cupcake stand, sit down, play a song on the piano. There was one house you walk by, the garage door opens, they play a, like a whole live band plays a song. There was one house that they had a like mobile, like kind of one of those like trailer things that you like pop out and it had a bar with bar stools and they were setting up like hot chocolate, spike talk chocolate. Like, What do you do with that? wagon the rest of the year you're just that into halloween that you have this setup ready to go (laughs) i think they do so that's like their jam over there so like listeners if you're really curious where this is this is half it's near half moon bay california so it's insane i (laughs) first time i did it was like pre-pandemic and i remember the woman gave me um what was it moonshine cherries which was like they had made their own moonshine and then soaked maraschino cherries in it and i had to work the next day and i just remember going back to my hotel and just being like shmammered being like okay i gotta i gotta wake up and like do stuff in the morning Um, so yes yes. so a plus energy i I, am you know as someone who wasn't allowed to do trick-or-treating or any of the dark arts the uh, this you know anything related to satan or the devil which now i am i am satan and the devil you are the devil and your best friend is wiccan so yeah <laughs> <laughs> i just like am very now i love halloween it's this like beautiful expression of play and mm-hmm. and celebration and you know dressing up and so now it's something that I, I love and go crazy for. So I'm going to give us a little bit of a some some backstory on trick or treating and other things that come up along the way. Are you ready? I'm you so excited? excited for Bex's notes. <laughs> yes. What's your favorite? Well, you said you've been a lot of princesses and stuff. What's your been a lot of princesses? Your... I said I think Spice Girls is one of my favorites that I've loved. I also. One of my ex-boyfriends and I were always pirates, like, and I, okay. like, him and I had, like, like we had a pirate well, He was a pirate the rest of the house. year as well, right? Wait, because I was? Yeah. No, he was. Yeah, he kind of was, yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you dated someone who was, like, in the pirate lifestyle, you know? There's, like, that kind of... Yes, he was definitely kind of in the pirate. Like, we had a pirate-themed room. Like, it was, like, it was, ex- it was extensive. Like, he really loved pirates, but it was, like, really fun because, like, we'd always have, like, parties and stuff, so... um yeah okay continue okay, I'm cute. all right well okay so there's a you know a farther back history that you know i'm not going to fully go into to Samhain, which i didn't know how to pronounce uh, it looks like it's sam hain and uh, that is not how you pronounce it apparently but trick-or-treating goes all the way back to the Celts and in in the Wiccan world and all the way back to 1000 BC when the Celts were coming over to Britain and Samhain is the third and final harvest and it's the witch's new year when the veil between the worlds is the thinnest and those spirits are crossing over so it's all about this like festival of appeasing these 
sort of unsettled spirits and it takes several permutations until we actually get to trick-or-treating but something i found was interesting is i was thinking about like why does it actually take place on october 31st and so then i was looking into like the julian calendar the gregorian calendar the celtic calendar and so it was actually Julius Caesar who commented, who created the Julian calendar, which is a solar based calendar. And the Celtic calendar is a lunar based calendar. And it's a little more accurate to have the solar calendar. Um, you don't have to change the, the cycle as often. Like I think the lunar calendar has to be like on like a five year calendar to, to remain accurate. But Julius Caesar was commenting that like the Celts organize their holidays, birthdays, celebrations, so that the night precedes the day. So yes. that's why you have like New Year's Eve, Christmas Eve, All Hallows Correct. Eve, that becomes Halloween. You celebrate the night before into the day because that's the, the beginning of it. And I was like, that is really interesting. I never like really like thought about that, how we celebrate things before the day of the holiday. Because um, the idea is like that nighttime brings like so many different things. Like nighttime is like the beginning, right? Like it's mm -hmm. like, you ended that day that day is over so it's that's totally a perspective thing but i didn't um i didn't know that julius caesar commented on it but thank you for that julius yeah so being that you know it's the it's the witch's new year at first this just started with people just dressing up in animal skins um to drive away the phantom visitors and there were banquets banquet tables uh, with food prepared to sort of soothe those spirits and kind of bless the the final harvest and then you'd enter the winter um, but then as you get to the all the way forward to the middle ages that's when you get mumming which is dressing like a mumming? ghost or mumming like and actually like philadelphia has a mummer's day parade is it m-u-m mm-hmm Okay. Okay. All right. I've never heard of this. Yeah. So mumming is actually dressing like a ghost, a demon to like scare away the spooky spirits and they would perform tricks like reciting a poem or juggling for food and drinks. So it wasn't like trick or treat, like trick, I'll trick you or I'll treat you. It's like, I'll do it. I'll do a trick and you'll give me a treat. <laughs> Okay, so it wasn't on or, it was an and. <laughs> trick I do treat. a trick and you give me a treat. Bex, I gotta know, what would your trick have been? My trick, I mean, I probably would have done like a little one person, like little character or like like a sketch, basically, like a little sketch okay. comedy or something, or maybe some poetry. Okay. But I actually, it's funny because I used to think like if I would go to Burning Man, it's all about like bartering, which I'm like, I think Burning Man is just people who love trick or treating because it's starting to sound a lot like just, you know, you dress up in a weird costume to scare away spooky spirits and you do your little trick to barter for some food. I'm like, isn't that what Burning Man is? You're or drugs. A barter? Yeah. yeah, or you get some drugs. <laughs> um but so, i say sitting here in my bejeweled face know, wearing a birthday a, you know crown on not my birthday so yeah you those are, like, weirdos over there at burning man <laughs> <laughs> but so in about a thousand so the the reason the like trick-or-treating starts to come into play and moves away from just like the pagan ritual of it is Christianity and always comes into play. So at about a thousand AD, when Christianity starts to come in to the Celt um, tribes in Britain, they establish All Souls Day for November 2nd. So that's where we get All Hallows Day, All Hallows Eve becomes Halloween. And in this time period, poor children would visit wealthy families and pray for the spirit of the family in exchange for food. So they were like, oh, we'll like, we'll offer, you know, we'll give your family even more prayers from us. We are just so poor. We want food, please. And so that was like, so they're like awful <laughs> little religious trick or treat for their um, mortal, mortal souls. Um, what I also like that and all we can list all our sources these i got some of the information here from uh history.com a great a great source same and, here girl same here <laughs> um, but some of the, they would all the, these little medieval children um you know offering up their prayers in exchange for food could also receive money and ale and i'm like let's bring that tradition back let's give the children you know money and ale we did get ale kind of i mean it wasn't actually ale True. but we got spirits yeah oh yeah. We got spirits for spirits the spirits, for spirits. On the of Halloween. Spirits for spirits. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, yes, and then uh, also there are some Scottish and Irish traditions 
instead of mumming, they call it guising, like a guise, like a disguise. And they would uh, do their little trick for fruit, nuts, or coins. Very exciting things to receive. Okay, do you think mumming is why they call them mummies? No. No, they call them mummies because okay. mummification. Okay, you know what? You're right. You're right. <laughs> but. <laughs> but they could have if the I same Latin myself. root word like mum mummification. I, yeah, I wonder if there is something to do with like visage or like. Um, that they might share a root word. That could be possible. Root word of modification. Uh, no, I don't believe so. That I don't, at okay. least from what I, I think it's Persian root of wax. Mm. Oh, well, that makes sense. Now we know. Okay. So okay. then we get to the 20th century and this is where we get the popularization of trick or treating as we know it in the United States, because we have all these like pagan rituals, these, these religious rituals, but after the potato famine, you have Irish people emigrating to the United States, Irish and Scottish immigrants, who, you know, at the begin of, beginning of the 20th century, they're, they're impoverished. Then you've got, like, they're mixing with the youth that are already in the United States. And you get mischief night. You get rambunctiousness. You get people starting to do, like bad stuff on halloween because they're just like we're poor we're in a new country we're going wild and that in turn the response is to make an organized trick-or-treating effort so then you get oh to get you, the youths in line they're like yes. like listen youths like everyone we're giving you a night you have your night to be rambunctious. We'll call it rambunctious night, but that didn't kick, that didn't take off. Like, they, no like like rambunctious night. Night. <laughs> they were like, hmm, let me workshop it. <laughs> and then immediately you get World War II and you get sugar rash. Shit. And then there's no more. Oh, I thought you meant the, the trick or treating cause. No, World War II. No, no. <laughs> it was like, they were like, we we're just starting to get our act together. And then World War II. And then. Okay. Okay. And then the people come back for more and then you get the baby boom era, era um, generation. Mm -hmm. And then there's lots of kids and then there's suburbia. And now trick or treating is solidified as this organized community thing that we do in these cookie cutter neighborhoods. Um, and today it's the second largest commercial holiday and $3.1 billion are spent on candy for on Halloween. Is Christmas the, is it Christmas is the it's first Christmas. commercial holiday? Yeah. Okay. Um, that is wild. Also, was it like when did trick when did Halloween get to like other countries then? If it was just like booming in the US. I don't think that other countries do it the same way we do it. I mean, you wouldn't have it in like London. They don't trick or treat, right? I have no idea. I've never been Well, no. I had to leave the airport in Heathrow, so I have technically set foot in London. Okay, wait, but it was... actually it does make sense that it would be in the United Kingdom because it is like British, like Celtic British. Okay, so it's you the, the countries oh it makes sense that it would be like Anglospheric countries. So United Kingdom, Ireland, United States, Canada, and Australia. Okay. So like not even the rest of Europe is getting down. Mm -hmm. I have seen like there was like a BuzzFeed article or something where it was like what other countries do at America parties. <laughs> and like one of them was costumes. <laughs> <laughs> we love a costume. Well, like, and, and here's another thing related to costumes. The other um, sort of influence on trick or treating and Halloween is as all cool symbolic things of today influenced by none other than Guy Fox. So we must remember, remember the 5th of November, which okay. was, if you watch V for Vendetta or any of the like, what are those like uh, super liberal guys? They do their like videos with just anonymous? the guy. Fox, yes. The anonymous videos with the Guy Fox mask that. Like Guy Fox was this revolutionary figure in England that he was part of the 1605 gunpowder plot to overthrow King James the first, who was like another yet again, another Protestant leader, you know, discriminating against Catholics. And so the Guy Fox, Guy Fox was the um, ammunitions explosives guy. And then, you know, the plot was discovered. He was caught. He, they were like really disturbingly like, 
you know, executed for their crimes, hung, drawn and quartered. And then in response to that, you know, there's this like Catholic sort of resurgence of bonfires and people celebrating right around that same time. So, oh, yeah, and dressing up with the Guy Fawkes mask. Yeah. So that also has some of like some ties into the, the season and how people celebrate and the bonfires and begging a penny for the guy, as they would call it. I also want the listeners to note down that this is the first time that I had the pop culture reference and Bex went with up, uh, followed up with the history reference. You're like, who is that group? And I was like, oh, I knew this one. It's anonymous. Like, <laughs> yes. Yes, I know. I'm like, it's, I don't know why I can't remember that. So one time we should savor this. I'll, I'll savor this moment. Well, speaking of pop culture, it starts to some references to trick or treating. Uh, first references to trick or treating uh, in America in 1951 in the Peanuts comic strip. They say trick or treat. And then 1952, Disney came out with a Donald Duck episode featuring Huey, Dewey, and Louie called Trick or Treat. So then... um, that was the year my mom and my dad were born, 1952. Oh. So uh, the, the trick or treating in Disney is as old as my mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, a couple other little tangents that came up from my trip down trick or treating lane. Uh, black cats. I wanted to know why, why, why are we so superstitious of black, about black cats and their tie into sacrifices during Halloween. So June 13th in 1233, the uh, Pope, oh my gosh, I didn't write down his name. Hold yeah, because you know I'm going to know which Pope it is if you don't Gregory you don't the, the name. Ninth. Everyone knows we the hate ninth. Gregory the Ninth. Because eighth was okay, ninth was all bad. <laughs> that hoe was so against the Luciferians coming out of Germany that he made a whole ban on cats because they were tied to witches as their familiars. And the thinking is that the so reason that's it was, what I've heard. Yeah, the reason yeah. that it was that black that was cats is just because mm-hmm. witches are practical and smart, and they're like. Black cats make better mouse hunters because they have stealth in the night. They're also just lucky for witches, right? Like, and so there's the idea that like, oh, like it's lucky for witches. Therefore, it must be bad for everyone else. Yes. And um, also Egyptians worship Bastet, a cat goddess. So they love cats. They love black cats. Mm -hmm. Scotland and Japan also consider black cats to be lucky. So it was only just this like religious backlash to witchcraftery that um, caused the first ban. And then it stuck because people started to get superstitious. And when a black cat would cross their path, they would go to their church, make an offering and like a prayer. And the church was like, yeah, this is definitely bad to, you know, to come across a black cat. Keep bringing your offerings here and to pray here. Your facial <laughs> on that was like, <laughs> hmm. Yeah, no, we go with bad. We go with bad. Yes. Uh, so that's that's super interesting. I didn't know. I didn't know that's where Friday the 13th came from either. Yeah. And also that's my mom's mm-hmm. birthday, June 13th. Um, uh, that's not a Friday. Was I just I making up? I a, don't know that it, it was, was I made up a about Friday, night. but maybe the first one was a Friday. That would be oh, gorgeous. Um, and I just then, like you were like June, and I heard Friday. <laughs> actually, my mom's birthday when it falls on a Friday, she's like, "It's lucky for me," and I think that's cute. I like it. Uh, some other things that come up around this time of year, if you see a teal pumpkin when you are out trick-or-treating, that began for allergy awareness. Um, so sometimes you'll see a tri- trick-or-treater with a little p- a teal pumpkin. That's to kind of like bring awareness that like obviously like nuts and like gluten and corn and there's certain things that it's harder for other trick-or-treaters. So that's kind of like a little bit of awareness project. And then someone took that and ran with it. And if you see blue pumpkins at all, that could also be for autism awareness, like signaling that like, oh, this might be a child that has some like, you know, differences in how they're going to communicate and, you know, be part of taking part of trick-or-treating so i thought that was fun to i've reference. heard that like other places with the blue and autism that mm-hmm. like i forget what i was reading it about but they were saying that like it's like a patch or like something that they carry around with them in case like like other people in society notice it and like they need help oh it's something for um first responders that's what it is and so like oh. the first responders can see it and identify it and be like 
like if you're struggling with something, like maybe you're having a panic attack or whatever, like, you know, if you have severe autism and they're going to think something's medically wrong with you and really like you might need space in that moment um, versus oh. someone coming at you. So, uh, yeah, that's super cool that they did for that with trick or treaters, too. I yeah. love that. I didn't I think that's really sweet. And then my last little tangent here is about the conspiracy around poison candy, candy with razor blades in it. So okay, okay, lay it on me. Tell is this real? The... <laughs> no, largely a hoax, and largely all cases have been dis- disproven except for a few that I'll briefly touch on. But you know, as we can see from the very roots of this holiday. As we go through history, there's a lot of like satanic panic, especially, you know, in the American 60s and 70s. But uh, coming out of the Industrial Revolution, when there weren't as many like food regulations, people would sometimes get indigestion after eating too much candy because like coal tar was used as dye and things were cooked in unlined copper and way too much corn syrup was used exclusively and just like caused indigestion. Um, And so people were just of the mindset of like, oh, things are like food is being prepared outside of the home. And we don't, it's like, we're having a distrust of receiving food from strangers. Um, But one of the earliest cases was 1959. William Shine was a dentist who was later convicted of insurance fraud, but he gave out over 400 pills of candy coated laxatives to children. On purpose or like this was... As a prank, which good one guy, real just joking of 1959. Um, So that was one of the only like real cases of a stranger giving strangers poison. But the like, can you imagine someone saying that today? Like some dentist giving laxatives to 400 children and just be like, no, it was just a joke. Like he would be like, he would be the one drawn and quartered. Like Jesus, like what? He would be, uh, but he was like, no, I'm just getting them ready for bikini season. Uh, <laughs> but the like razor blades and that kind of thing. No, there have been no cases of proven, uh, of proven cases of anyone receiving razor blades from just in candy they receive from a stranger. There have been what they call like the copycat effect where like relatives or people you actually know slip one in not to actually hurt you, but like to pretend be like, see, and it's like, oh, that wasn't really like from a stranger. That's just someone like pranking on their, their relative. Um, Don't do that people. (laughs) If you're like, if you're one of those people who's like, I'm just gonna like, no, it's not necessary. Cause it's like always like what something happens. What if someone doesn't get it? Then in 1970, a little boy found his uncle's heroin, poisoned himself and died. And the family was like, quick, let's sprinkle some heroin in his Halloween candy so that we don't get in trouble for negligence. And we'll say that it was like this, like, you know, poison candy scenario. So that was another like (laughs) fraud. And then in the 1980s, there were the Tylenol poisonings. Where, yes, I remember where those. Mm-hmm. that's why we have the like the the gauze and the foil Pop. on top. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's mm-hmm. not why we have the gauze. That's why we have the foil. Um, but that was like also like hysteria sweeping the nation. There was uh, okay, and then this is another one where it was not like something received from a stranger, but it was like tried someone tried to pass it off as their child received poison candy in 1974. Ronald O'Brien, Ronald O'Brien, gave his son, his daughter, and her friend, um, and I think two other. I think it was like ultimately five children. He gave poison pixie sticks. So those big, long, like, pixie sticks, he put potassium Mm -hmm. cyanide in there. Only the son ate it, and he died. Now, the dad did this on purpose because, as you can guess, he had just taken out a life insurance policy on his child. He was $100,000 in debt. He said, the boy can go, which is, like, an odd choice. It's kind of, like, feminist because he had a son and a daughter, and he was like, let's kill the boy. But he he made sure that his son, like, like, (laughs) spilled on the the floor recently. I like him less. You are not. You really need to make sure you're making Santa's naughty or nice list or you know we're gonna get you for the insurance money so he was very bad at covering his tracks and it was a very you know very quickly discovered that he uh yeah just straight up murked his child so he was sentenced to death and he got himself a poison pixie stick he uh, was uh given the uh, <laughs> lethal injection in march 1984 good 
So, um, yeah, all of those were just like either, you know, some other kind of like prank, hoax, murder, but there aren't really any known cases of, um, you know, rampant actual razor blades actual in your Snickers, razor blades and poison candy and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, just maybe a product of also like now, like neighborhoods starting to integrate and like fear of like strangers and others and that kind of like 60s and 70s era of like racism and um just a lot going on in society for people to to be afraid of other people basically it's funny because like my mom is like you know i travel a lot i travel by myself and i make risky decisions and my mom's always just like oh like what if somebody gets you in that country and i'm like mom statistically the people who are going to get me are my loved ones <laughs> so um uh, it's usually someone you know like, it's, like, ni- over 90%, like, right? So, honestly, like, when everyone's always, like, oh, your Snickers bar, oh, this is happening out in the world, and I'm, like, you're hearing about it because it's the exception and it's rare, not because, like, every time I have gone to Mexico, I have gotten kidnapped and, you know, we did get in that unmarked van. <laughs> yeah, and so. we weren't kidnapped. It was fine. Okay, and then my last little tidbit, because I literally hate nothing more in this world than candy corn. I was like, why do we have candy corn? It was invented by George Redinger in 1880s in Philadelphia, and it was originally Philly, meant, that's your city. It was meant to mimic chicken feed, because farmers were one of the largest demographics in the workforce. And I'm like, okay, it was so gross from the beginning. I, I hate it so much. <laughs> yeah, I don't get the, I don't get the inspiration there. But you know what? Okay. Because you, okay. you feed corn to chickens. So yeah. it's like candy mm-hmm. corn. No, I get, I get it, but I, I wouldn't want to be like, oh, it's funny, you eat it too. Like, I would like... <laughs> it's weird. It's weird. Um, well, thanks, Bex. That was a nice little treat Um, that you did a trick. For... No, wait. Yeah. You just did a trick I and I'll my give trick. you a treat. I want my treats now. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome, though. I did not know most of that about Halloween uh, trick-or-treating, and I am glad I do. Uh, For my part, we're going to go in the Wayback Machine. So we are going to talk about where Samhain came from. And I think it's perfect because you highlighted on some of these uh, pieces of just kind of like the history and how old it is. And I'm really glad that you started with the fun part so I didn't lose everybody at the beginning of the episode. (laughs) Um, So here we go. Um, It starts on sunset of October 31st and goes to November 1st, as you mentioned. It starts in the evening. Um, and it's one of the celebrations marking the change of seasons. And it's the most significant one because it is the beginning of the year and their belief. Well, my belief, <laughs> um, the first one is Imbolc, which is uh, the celebration halfway between the winter solstice and the spring solstice. So this, what is that? Uh, that's like fall, right? No winter solstice. Wait. So that's spring, the beginning of spring. So that's like your birthday essentially. Yeah. Um, there's Beltan, which is halfway between the spring equinox and the summer solstice. Wait, I think my notes I think are that's, off here. I think, I think Beltane is the one that's closer to my birthday. That's yeah, in like May, I, right? I have my notes are wrong. Birthday. Anyways, <laughs> Samhain is the one that is on the fall, uh, is between fall equinox and winter solstice. So it's halfway there. Um, a lot of this uh, information is pulled from the History Channel. So... Uh, What I'm about to say next, because it was kind of like a nice little quote here, is um, after the harvest work was completed, celebrants joined the Druid priest to light a community fire using a wheel that would cause friction and spark flames, which sounds really, really cool to look at. Mm. The wheel was considered to be a representation of the sun and used along with prayers. Cattle were sacrificed, which is a little (laughs) like I definitely do not do that now, to be very clear. Um, And participants took a flame from the communal bonfire back to their home uh, to relight their hearths. So they would all let their hearths go out in their individual home. And then they would have the celebration for Samhain. They would have this massive bonfire, the feasting that you mentioned. They'd have some sacrifice. And then I just think it's like really like this beautiful like kind of thing to like go back, take that piece of the fire and go back and relight your arms. It's a community. Yeah. Yeah. so early text presented uh, sound is a mandatory celebration lasting three days and three oh. nights, which I'm all about a party. You must party. party. <laughs> you must party three days. And three, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and the rec- uh, community was required to show themselves to local kings and chieftains. Failure to participate was believed to result in punishment from the gods, usually illness or death. So show up or die. Getting smited. Smoke? 
smoke. Um, the, <laughs> thank you. The the Hill of Ward, aka I'm gonna destroy this. Mm. The Lachtaga, I don't know. And in County Meath, so this is all Irish, so this is all going to be pronouncing it completely wrong. Um, it's the sacred Gaelic. site of. Thank you. The sacred site of the fire festival where they would have this bonfire. Um, so it was named for a powerful druidess who died giving birth to triplets there. Um, oh, and this is, is what the pop- fire festival was about. Well, that's what the hill was named after. So the just, fire. F- <laughs> but it was just a big scam to get everyone on an island and get their, you know, get the make a several oh, documentaries that- out of it um that uh, that is a different file festival and i really would not have ever been okay with that i am gonna send you a picture of this hill if i can ever get it over to it i don't know why it won't and the only other i think also lunasa is one of the the four festivals. yes that was the fourth one and that's like also the name of an irish band an Irish folk band. Oh, is it? <laughs> I'm glad that you knew how to but, say it because I certainly did not. Well, I think it's I don't know how to... with a lot of phlegm, but um, I yeah, want there to I... be an Irish band for all of the festivals. I'm like, can we get a Beltane? Can we get a Samhain? <laughs> or a Samhain? An Imbolc? Yeah, I'm, I'm here for it. Um, so this is pulled from the New Grange, which describes these hills. So two hills in the Boyne or Bon Valley were associated with uh, Samhain in Celtic Ireland. The Latch... I can't say that one. It's the Latchka. <laughs> I'm going to send it to you because you'll be able to say it. I guarantee it. You were so much better at pronouncing pretty much anything. Um, and so these were the, uh, the, the, hmm. the locations of the Great Fire Festival, which began the eve of Hall- uh, Samhain. Samhain. Oh, I'm saying it. Uh, Tara was also associated, uh, associated with Samhain. However, it is secondary to the other uh, hill. So do you, did you see the text I sent you? Can you say that? Yes, but I would have pronounced it. I just looked up how it's pronounced. The way it's pronounced, or the way it's spelled, I would I would think like Tlagta. Tlagka. Thank you. But it's pronounced apparently Glikka. <laughs> <laughs> Are you... <laughs> So I know a woman named Aoife, and she's Irish, but the oh, way that mm-hmm. she spells her name it looks like Aofi, right? Yes. Like, and in my head, I said Aofi for, like, months before I met her, yes. and they were like, Aoife, and I was like... I know, it sounds you- actually normal when you say it out loud, but you're like, it looks like Aofi, or, like, same with, like, Sersha, looks like Sawarsi. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're from Wisconsin, <laughs> so Arcy, <laughs> don't you know eh? Sarsha? Don't you know it's Sarsha? Uh, I, I love a good Irish accent. I just I, I do could too, do it but all I, day. Do I can't do the Scottish, but I wish I were Irish. I can't do any accents, as we've talked about many, many times. I always <laughs> sound incredibly racist, um, and they're like, "I'll do like it, like an Irish accent," and people are like, "Why do you sound like Italian?" And I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you say it again licky Klikka, like k-l-e-e-k-g-a Klikka, which i don't know okay. how that translates from a t but that's what google said they are weird the irish letters are very weird and i cannot explain them well you remember that one irish guy I went out with the spider monkey thing oh boy and he like told me he sent me oh no he called me a spider monkey and then i was like no no. Uh, okay, that's a fun little okay. tangent. Okay, the entrance passage to the mound of hostages, which is like oh, where this whole kind of like what I fire call my bedroom. <laughs> yeah, mound of hostages. Like hostages, okay, but mound just like no one wants a mound of humans. Okay, the mound of hostages. I bet there's a different way of pronouncing it in Irish, but like, oh, okay. I'm gonna send you here. Yeah, send you a little. You can look at the pictures of it all. It's it's quite pretty. Like I mean, it, it's just hills. It's not special. Like if I saw this, I wouldn't have thought, oh, witchcraft. Um. So, <laughs> yeah, just the amount of hostages is about 
4,500 to 5,000 years old. So very, very old. Suggesting that Samhain was celebrated long before the first Celts arrived in Ireland, about 2,500 years old. Wow. About 2,500 years ago. So this festival is older than Celtic tradition, right? It actually probably is, is possibly like Norwegian or um, like Viking, similar to what they do. Um, so pulled from worldhistory.org, which I definitely misspelled history and trying to write that citation. Um, the New Grange and the Mound of Hostages, for example, date back approximately 5,000 years. Just as the passageway uh, at New Grange is aligned with the sunrise of the winter solstice, when its inner chamber and passageway is illuminated, the Mound of Hostages, hostages I bet it's something like that, is aligned with the sunrise around Samhain suggesting that this particular time of year has played an important role in ancient Irish spirituality for at least 5,000 years, which is like, I also really love. Cause like I have very, like I have Irish. I, I said that like, Irish. I have Irish. I have Scottish. I have Irish, I have it just Scottish. comes out of you suddenly. <laughs> it just comes out to me, you know, uh, your hair turns red. <laughs> <laughs> well, like that's like, we got, that's strong in my family, right? That's on both sides of my family, that lineage. Um, so I, that's particularly why I think I have leaned towards like paganism and Wicca because it is very much aligned with what my roots are along with kind of my beliefs and being one with the community, being one with the land, being one with everything around you. So I really like that. It's like so old and how long it's been around. And that's just kind of <clears throat> really fun for me. Um, okay. So... So this was kind of goes back to your trick you're treating. Costumes and masks were common to disguise themselves from bad and harmful spirits. So like they back then they weren't doing the trick or treating, but they were still wearing costumes and masks and it was part of that heritage, which eventually did become that. Um, and they would light the large communal bonfires. There were animal sacrifices, which we kind of talked about. Um, but that was like really part of like the land that was part of like, you didn't just sacrifice the animal and then not have the meat, right? Like it was part of a ceremony where everything was used back then and like giving, giving thanks. I have to like think that like as much as it disgusts me now to do something like, like kill an animal for my own religious beliefs, I do realize that back then it wasn't, you weren't killing an animal for religious, you were going to eat it, right? Like that's something that I don't kill my own meat now. And if I had to, I'd be a vegetarian. So <laughs> yeah, um, I don't think I, I could kill th a pig with my bare hands or a cow. I could not. I, I, not even with a weapon. I couldn't do it. I couldn't even press a button and do it. Um, so the Druid priest, priest would also throw bones into the fire, often of animals from the harvest. Um, and this is where the bon the word bonfire comes oh. from. Well, fire. Which bonfire. is, I thought was like... <laughs> Right. Isn't that I never knew that, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so this is also the Celtic New Year's. So this ushers in the dark period of the year. It's the end of the summer, which is the end of the harvest season, which you give great uh, gratitude and thanks for. It's the most uh, significant of the four quarterly fire festivals. So there's fire festivals, um, which is the ones that we were we were naming the one that you can say that I cannot lug Hansa, Beltan and Embalk. Mm -hmm. And then um, it kicks off the winter, which is the start of the year. Um, and winter is associated with death. So you just come from this period of light and now you're entering a period of death. And that is why this is the day that which they believe the, the veil between the living and the dead is the most thin, which I also think next year, maybe we'll do Dia de Mortis. It's very similar to their belief as well, that the veil is very thin. This is the time that you connect with, with ancestors and people that you have lost. So um, it's the easiest days for spirits to visit their loved ones, similar to the beliefs yeah, of Dia de Mortis. Um, and it's time to honor their ancestors. And so you often will build an altar for them. You'll lay out food um, from the feast. And what I thought was also really sweet, it said that the food from the feast was uh, never wasted, even though you left it out for your ancestors, that would then be shared with um, the less fortunate in your Aww. community. So we've given gratitude and then we share it out, which I thought was like really, really beautiful. It um, has a couple flies on it. It's fine. I mean, honestly, back then, though, like <laughs> you didn't have like a, you know, a food kitchen or anything that you could go to. So this was the best that you could get. And I probably I'll, I'll take it. And you didn't have lawyers yet. So 
no lawyers. <laughs> yeah, your your rules of trick or treating and pixie sticks is is you know this is way light years behind. Um, uh, this is also so this is where Halloween came from. This is in the Middle Ages. People would carve turnips, uh, oh. and they would light by coal, and they would hang them from a string connected to a stick. So like like our microphones were almost like upside down. That would be a turnip. Uh, and they called it a jack-o'-lantern. Oh, and light okay. later, uh, the Irish decided to carve the pumpkins instead. And then I had that in 1800s, October 31st, became known as All Hallows Eve or um, Halloween because it was the day before All Hallows Day. Mm -hmm. um, followed by November 2nd, which is All Souls Day, which I don't, I honestly, I don't know what All Hallows Day or All Souls Day is because I'm not religious um you're like, mm -hmm. you're like yes those are days those are church days where you do church stuff um and then a couple other notes is that holiday traditions include feasting dancing and hiking um and build, building ancestry altars so i was like it kind of seems almost like um thanksgiving in a way too like it's like <laughs> the old school thanksgiving and then there's a bunch of myths um, associated with Samhain and the why it's celebrated and all of that history behind it. Um, and I got a whole bunch of sources, so I will leave these in my notes of we have um, the Boston Public Library, History Channel, World History. Um, oh, and cat. those were some of the things that I got. I know. He's being a, he's been a little stinker Spooky lately. Spooky cat. Little, little haunted I know. Boy. My black cat's over there. Not fitting in his current... Um, pouch but that's my little like my little mini history lesson on Samhain there was a lot of information so I tried to keep it short and sweet for us any questions that was gorgeous I'm gonna try I'm gonna carry that sentiment with me into the the season the sort of you know the thanksgiving the the gratitude for like being in harmony with the natural world and kind of Getting in your last harvest, your last, you know, metaphorical, emotional, spiritual harvest, and then being present in that dark time of the year. And that also, um, is it Purim? That's the Jewish holiday, winter, one of the um, Jewish winter holidays, um, where like, Oh no, that's the wrong time of the year. I don't know, but the, just I guess the idea Not that like work. during the winter and these like dark times of the year it's not like necessarily a negative. Like we have times when we need to rest and like reflect yeah. and enter with more brightness into the to the light, you know, but to let ourselves have that that winter and to lie and rest and hibernate. I agree. I think it's perfect. I think that's, it's a quiet time of the year and it's time to like rebuild and start focusing on like what your plans are, what comes out in spring, what are you doing? And I think I've spent a lot of my life looking back the last few years, I've really focused on looking forward, but I think this year I really am going to like spend some time being grateful for you know, those that have been lost, right? Like in letting that veil be thinner and giving my gratitude mm -hmm. for them. Um, you know, we talked about this in a previous episode. I found a lot more family recently. <laughs> and I think it just, it brings all of that to like the top of mind. And I think a lot of people in my family I've let go of over time. And I'm like, oh, well, maybe, maybe this year is the year to say a little thank you and, and do a little altar for everybody and, you know, give them a little bit of a shine. So. All right, Bex, any other Gorgeous. thoughts for the the spooky season? Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween, everyone. Let's go be experts. Spooky experts. That was great. And that was the show. Thank you, everyone, for watching, and we hope you stay curious. If you enjoyed this video, watch our other videos here on YouTube. Or you should listen to the episode on We're Experts Now podcast. Bex, where can they find us? You can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeart Music. And what if they want to talk to us? If you have ideas for something you want us to investigate, send us an email at we'reexpertspod at gmail.com. That's W-E-R-E-E-X-P-E-R-T-S-P-O-D at gmail.com. Great job on that spelling. Ooh. A plus. Do you do this professionally? I believe we're both doing it professionally right now. 
wow, people should know about this. I completely agree. And you can find us on Instagram at We're Experts Now Pod. Thanks again. And if you enjoy the show, subscribe and comment. And do not forget to leave a five star tip. That's a great idea. Are you a podcast expert? I think we both are. I think we're, we're experts, experts now. now. This has been a Just Being Better Media production.